And then number three is Serbia. I was a first generation Polish American. Uh, I, I did all my schooling in the States, university, but I would spend every summer in Poland. It sounds like you cashed in on your question. If making memes um, was my passion or is my passion, then I guess so. But I actually read this one book that was like, I have to say that there was a lot of great talent and a lot of hardworking people. We were early when it comes to brokerage outsourcing. Some Americans that are, you know, against it. They, they believe that the jobs should stay in America. You shouldn't be outsourcing it. And then there's some that are really open to it. Uh, Serbia has been like a top destination for me. That's, that's a good question. Before this episode starts, I have a small favor to ask from you. Last month, more than 80% of the people who watched this channel did not subscribe. My goal is 50%. If you ever liked any of the videos we posted, if you like this channel, can you please do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button? It helps us more than you know. And the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guest gets. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Well, one and all, and welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Podcast your quality source for USA trucking industry ins and outs. In this episode, our guest today needs no special introduction, but for the less fortunate of you who do not know of him, we'll do it anyway. So she's the co-founder of Freight Caviar, the trucking meme lord, and the definitive behind the newly launched shipper CRM platform. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for one and only Paul Bernard Yaroslavsky. BBJ, welcome to the show and thank you for our time. How's the life in logistics media industry? <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, how's the life? It's, it's busy, um, productive, just got to keep working hard. Everyone knows the, you know, the downturn in the, in the freight market has been, you know, with us for the last couple of years and you know, the same thing goes with, with marketing spending for companies. So, uh, it's just, you know, always working hard and trying to be creative, uh, to, to make a living and, and live a prosperous life. But thanks again for having me. And I'm excited to talk. For those of, uh, that out there that do not know of you, uh, can you provide the background story on your pets before the freight caviar and also how the freight caviar came to be. Definitely. Uh, so I became a freight broker back in 2015. I had just graduated college. I went, so I grew up, I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, my, my parents, uh, are, they immigrated from Poland, uh, during communism. So I was a first generation Polish American. Uh, I, I did all my schooling in the States university, but I would spend every summer in Poland. So I would visit my grandparents, my family here in Poland every summer. Uh, so that's just that background. But when I graduated university, I, um, I got an offer to be a freight broker, my fraternity brother, uh, in America, we have like these fraternities, like, uh, maybe like an American pie, like the movies you've seen, like there's these fraternities. And, um, I was a psychology bachelor degree and I was, I was planning on doing my master's in psychology because typically with a bachelor's degree, there's not many options, but I was at the, the career fair, uh, at my university in Urbana Champaign in Illinois. And, uh, my, my fraternity brother was there with a company. Uh, and so like I was walking by and he was like, Paul, oh, like you should, you should check out Trek freight. Uh, and like, I had no idea what a broker was, uh, but because he was my fraternity brother, I was able to get a job, uh, at Trek freight right out of college. I was just a carrier sales rep at the beginning. And one of the first things I noticed, uh, right away was the fact that there's such a large Eastern European population in trucking in, in Chicago and in the United States overall. And so I started building a lot of relationships with the Polish trucking companies because I spoke Polish and I was the only one in the office that spoke Polish. And so it was my advantage. Um, I, I learned quickly and then I, I started uh, talking to a lot of dispatchers uh, throughout that time. And I realized that, oh, there's dispatchers in Serbia, there's dispatchers in Poland, there's dispatchers in Ukraine. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, this is, that's cool. Like I, I was like, wow, what if I could do that? You know, what if I could live in Europe and, you know, work on the U S market? So, um, that was like the first year that was 2015 and 2016. I ended up leaving the company. They ended up getting acquired by Becker logistics like two years ago. So they're not, they're, they don't exist anymore. They're, they're acquired. Uh, but 
I ended up uh, leaving. I, I thought for some reason I wasn't going to go back into logistics because it was very stressful, but I ended up traveling a little bit and I came home uh, like a, a year later broke. I had no money in my bank account. And so I there's this recruiting company in Chicago uh, that's really well known. It's called CS Recruiting, started by Charlie Safro. And I, I knew a, a, a girl that worked there and she was like, Paul, if you ever need a logistics job, like reach out to me and I'll get you like, you know, interviews and all this stuff. So I ended up getting four job interviews in one week with four brokers, uh, got four, four job offers, uh, all in Chicago. And there's this one company called Everest that stuck out. They were like a small startup in Evanston at the moment. There was like seven, seven guys. It was just really laid back. It wasn't corporate. There was no HR. Um, and one of the owners was like, Paul, like, you know, we'd like during the interview process, he was like, maybe we will send you out to Ukraine because we already have like two people in Ukraine. Maybe you could go run our office for you in, in Ukraine. I'm like, this was back in 2017. I was 24, single, living with my parents. I'm like, that sounds amazing. Like, yes, like I'm all in for that. So I ended up um, after working for uh, Everest in like the Chicago area for, for 10 months, I ended up moving to, to Ukraine back in 2017 in November. And I lived there for three years. Uh, we built up an office from four to 100 people. It was just all outsourced uh, dispatch, well, freight brokers, carrier sales reps, uh, account management. Like we had very various job roles and we grew that from four to 100 people. I was like the only American that was managing the whole office. And then during the pandemic, um, I just was getting, I got, you know, really tired and burnt out by everything. And uh, you know how the market was after, well, like November, 2020, like it was getting crazy. And I was like, okay, like I had enough money saved up. I'm like, I'm gonna, I wanna move to Poland. Cause I was kind of like where I wanted to live for a while. And so I ended up uh, moving in November, 2020 to Poland. And I quit Everest in October, 2020. And throughout my time at Everest, you know, there was like these Instagram pages, like detention denied, uh, USA transportation, uh, I hate freight, you know, there was all these accounts and we in the office would just always start laughing at all these pages because they're just hysterical. And for some reason, this was so super random. For some reason, the day after I quit, uh, Everest, I was, uh, I was at the gym and I had this idea that I will create an Instagram account for memes. Um, and I will, I was called shipping pallets at first. So it was just shipping pallets and all I was going to do was just post memes and like just post stupid content, uh, for, for, I was, my goal was 10,000 followers in 10 months. And so I ended up, uh, doing that. Like the memes were awful at first. Uh, I was just posting, posting. This was October, 2020, uh, in November, 2020, I moved to Poland. I started my own small brokerage. So I was in Poland. I had one customer, uh, out of Northwest Ohio. So I was booking like a couple loads a week, uh, with that, but most of the time I was just spending uh, on Instagram. And after 10 months, I had 10,000 followers. And, um, a few months in, in May of 2021, I was listening to the rap caviar playlist on Spotify. And I'm like, I was listening. And I'm like, you know what? I think freight caviar would be a great name for us. And I called my good friend, Tom, who lives in Poland. He's also, uh, does outsourcing for companies out here, logistics companies. And, and I'm like, Tom, what do you think of freight caviar? And he was like, Paul, I absolutely love that you have to do Freight Caviar. So I immediately changed all of our, our usernames to Freight Caviar. Uh, and that was May 2021. After we got 10,000 followers, which was August of 2021, I ended up thinking about the podcast and the newsletter. And that was kind of like my main motivation was to definitely grow the newsletter. Uh, I'm a big newsletter reader. I like the Morning Brew, uh, which is like a business newsletter that I read every day. And I'm like, it'd be cool to have that for Freight. And like along the way, like companies came and they, they wanted to sponsor us. So we kind of grew from there. And, and so far we have, there's five of us, uh, together and there, we have a writer, uh, Adriana, we have social media managers, Kaya and Danielle. And then, uh, I have my co-founder Christian, who we started Shipper CRM with, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's been a, quite a journey and it's been some, something unexpected. It wasn't something that I planned out. I never thought I would be making money off of freight caviar. It was just kind of a joke at first. Uh, but now it's like my job. So it's, it's been pretty cool. So it's, it sounds like you cashed in on your question. Um, <laughs> if, if making memes, um, was my passion or is my passion, then I guess so. But, uh, I definitely have matured a lot since like the early days. Uh, and you could, you could probably see that through my content. It's, it's been a little bit more mature, but you need the memes because people love the memes. Yeah. Yeah. People love the memes. 
And then uh, yeah. I'll circle back to your time spent in Ukraine and uh, working abroad so within the industry. So you managed from four to up to a hundred people within uh, three years uh, within that Ukraine office. What was your first impression when once you got there in regards to people, knowledge, uh, industry related? And how has it changed by the time you left? Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, it's definitely when I got there, I was young. I was twenty four. Uh, I never really managed anyone before, and so when I got there, first of all, uh, there are cultural differences between working with Americans in America and working with people in Ukraine. Just like in every every country, every every culture has their own like distinct kind of way of doing things. And that, that also applies to business. Uh, so, um, I guess one of the first things was, well, I had to kind of learn how to manage people. So, uh, I started reading books, uh, about like, you know, American books about management, stuff like that. I actually read this one book that was like the psychology of like work cultures, which was phenomenal because it compared various countries and how they compared to like Americans in terms of like, like work and how to like approach people differently. And one of the funny things was that everyone in the office called me Mr. Paul, you know, people that were 40 years old would call me Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul. And I'm like, it is kind of funny. And it's, it's, it was definitely something that struck, struck or stuck out to me. But, um, what I would say is that people were definitely, um, well, very, they, they were really, uh, knowledgeable in English. So they had great English skills. Uh, at least the people that we interviewed, we, we would have interviewed people that didn't have good English skills, but there was a lot of talent, uh, available, uh, and they're obviously willing to work hard and learn, learn the industry. So I, I think, you know, uh, it was, it was definitely a great time and I learned a lot. It was, you know, coming there where I, I didn't know how to manage people to developing some manager skills to then actually uh, you know, hiring people, but it was, it was a learning process the whole time. But I have to say that there was a lot of great talent and a lot of hardworking people. By the time you got there at, at those first moments, the people that you interviewed and hired, uh, I suppose had some previous experience, uh, what did they say? How have they acquired it? Yeah. Uh, you know what? We actually hired a lot of people without experience. And we just kind of like train them. Uh, I would say a lot of the early hires had no experience. And, and that so like back in 17, 20, 2017. Yeah. And, you know, we were kind of, we were early when it comes to brokerage outsourcing because brokers didn't really start outsourcing until like 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, obviously there were some companies that were outsourcing, no doubt about it. But it, w it was kind of taboo in a way uh, to do so from the United States. Uh, but we did hire we did hire a few dispatchers. We hired actually um, someone that used to work for Landstar, who was a double broker uh, in, in, a, in a Landstar agency. Uh, I'm not sure if we want to cut that out or not. But he uh, he he <laughs> he he was a double broker, and so he knew. Uh, before that he was a double broker, um, not, not a scammer, just double broker where, you know, through Landstar, you, you, you give the truck to him or the load to him and he would find another truck. Uh, and he, he was definitely really, uh, really good at what he did because he kind of understood all the aspects, uh, cause going from double brokerage to brokerage is a little bit easier. Uh, so he, he was actually really good. Uh, but overall, I would say most of the people that we brought on were actually, uh, untrained and we would train them. So I would say that your connections in this industry are almost unmatched, one might say. So what would you say that is the overall impression uh, of the U.S.-based workers in this industry towards the ones outsourced out, uh, overseas? It's definitely mixed. Um, you're going to get some, uh, some Americans that are, you know, against it. They, they believe that the job should stay in America. You shouldn't be outsourcing it. And then there's some that are really open to it. So it, I mean, I would say for the most part, the people that I'm like connected to and speak to typically are, are really open to it. 
Um, you know, it's like w when you look at all these major corporations in America, like, like just for example, Nike, I mean, Nike was so successful because they were manufacturing shoes in Asia for $2 and selling them in America at a premium. They weren't able to manufacture in America and sell them in, in America. So, and then what happened, I read this, I read the book uh, called Shoe Dog, which is, uh, the, the founder of, uh, of Nike, kind of his whole story. And they first, uh, in the seventies, they were manufacturing shoes in Japan. And then Japan's economy that started doing really well, it was too expensive to manufacture in, in Japan. So then they moved to Korea after Korea's economy boomed, they moved to Taiwan after Taiwan's economy boom, they moved to Vietnam and Southeast Asia. And so what you, what you could notice from this pattern is the fact that these economies developed because of these jobs and because they developed, they obviously were trading more with the U S they were buying more from the U S they, they had more money, more capital available. And my, you know, belief is that, you know, if we're outsourcing these jobs, uh, to other countries, we're building up their economies, we're making them stronger, which in turn will also make the world economy better and also like benefit everyone. So I, I have like an opinion that it's, you know, we're, we're living in a global economy nowadays. Um, well, you know, ever, ever since the war a couple of years ago, you know, things have changed a little bit, but overall we're living in a global economy, um, where, you know, it's like people have to also be very competitive in business, especially nowadays in the logistics industry. It's like, how do you stay competitive? Well, you stay competitive by, you know, lowering costs. And so outsourcing is definitely a great way to do that, especially like, you know, for Americans, if they want to compete against, you know, I guess, or if they want to have the jobs, they have to, you know, prove themselves. They have to work harder. They have to build better relationships. They can't, they can't get lazy. Uh, you know, they have to, uh, you know, keep getting educated and creative. So I have to say that like the, the opinion overall is mixed, right? And, uh, but over, like you, you definitely saw a trend after COVID where a lot of brokers started outsourcing. Uh, well, they, they call it nearshoring. They don't call it outsourcing. They call it nearshoring to Colombia, Mexico, Latin America, because uh, that's where predominantly brokers outsource. And then carriers typically go to Eastern Europe. So now, when you already mentioned Eastern Europe, uh, previously you told us that your bearings moved from London to USA, and then just one one generation later, you've done the opposite. What yeah. was the drive behind your decision to move to Poland? You are residing in Poland now for some time, right? Yeah, uh, almost four years. So, I mean. The drive it's uh it's probably a little bit complicated in a way um but if what i actually been thinking about this lately because it's like i have my siblings in the states i have my my parents in the states and it's like what drove me here like i've always kind of wanted to live here and um i when i was 10 months old i my my parents got divorced and my mom actually sent me to live with my grandparents in poland for like two years i don't remember this because i was a baby I was it was and then I had moved uh before preschool back to the states but I've always had this like desire and like I felt this like really good just being here uh so it is kind of strange and bizarre uh but I think there is some that some of that component that I was here like as a baby uh like with my grandparents and then like I spent every summer here as well um so I think that's part of it and besides that I just I've always traveled a lot and I don't know. It, it's always been just, I feel at home here. Yeah. It feels like, well, oh, that, that, that's yeah. what came to my mind when you were talking about it. Uh, you, you do travel a lot and, uh, recently you have been to Serbia. So how was your trip to Serbia and what was the idea behind this destination? Uh, Serbia has been like a top destination for me for a long time. Uh, so my neighbors growing up were actually, uh, from Serbia. Uh, we, I looked at, I lived in this very diverse area of, uh, like Northwest Chicago, where the high school I went to was, it was like mostly Eastern Europeans and like people from all over the world. Cause we had a lot of people from Asia, Africa, it was just a diverse melting pot. And so I had a lot of, first of all, like my neighbors were like, from Serbia and we we're the same age, we would play with each other all the time. They actually had just, they had escaped from the war uh, and then they had moved. And so they were 
they were just from Serbia and uh, we spent a lot of time with them. And then a lot of my friends growing up were Serbian. Um, and so I, I had always this desire to visit Serbia. Uh, and then obviously when I got into logistics and kind of realized how much outsourcing happens in Serbia, and then I, I saw on Frey Caviar in our statistics, like we have, uh, like Serbia is one of the most, like we have, just to be more exact, I think 68% of our audience on Instagram is from the U.S. Uh, so that's U.S. based. Uh, about 6% is from Armenia. That's number two. And then number three is Serbia with about 5% of our audience is from Serbia. So when I saw that, it was like, okay, like I have to go there. And it's been something that I've, that's been on my mind for a long time. And then timing was perfect for March. So I was there two months ago. And uh, that was like the reasoning behind it. I was like, there has, there's a lot of companies out there. Let's, let's go visit. Let's create a documentary, which we're going to release at the end of May. Do yeah, we know the topic of the documentary? Uh, it's just a broad topic of basically like the outsourcing um, scene in, in Serbia overall. It's just kind of like talking about Serbia. I was, I was hanging out with, uh, with Alex Bates, uh, with Omar uh, from SWIG, and we just filmed a lot of content. Uh, we interviewed some people like it was just kind of um, just it's going to be a comprehensive view of of the Serbian outsourcing scene. And what were your takeaways after this visit? Was there something you really maybe did not like? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I was actually shocked by like how welcoming everyone was. Uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me, a lot of people take care of us. I have to shout out, to give a shout out to CW Carriers for, uh, for taking us to the Derby. Uh, they actually uh, lent us their apartment also in Belgrade. So, uh, I mean, it was, it was a phenomenal time. Uh, I met a lot of people. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, you know, good food and uh, at Akia uh, <laughs> throughout the time. Yeah. So it, it, honestly, I mean, I was, I was surprised of like how, uh, how welcoming everyone was. I, I had a really, really good time uh in terms of like shock i never i wasn't shocked by anything i would say so you came preparing yeah well i was maybe shocked by like the super ego sign outside the airport yeah <laughs> <laughs> i i i pass that road almost every day and i'm all i'm still shocked <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like chicago in chicago they have a lot of uh advertisements as well for your opinion how do you industry relate to people see brokers and dispensers from the Balkans. Balkans? I mean, it really depends on, on your experience and your relationships. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, brokers that have phenomenal relationships with dispatchers from the Balkans. And at the end of the day, like, I mean, I since day one for me as being a broker, uh, there was always someone I was talking to uh, that was a dispatcher in Eastern Europe in the Balkans. And uh, like, for the most part, it was very positive. Obviously, there are some situations that maybe were, weren't the best, uh, but I would say like the ones that you built a relationship with and the ones that you know, they do a great job. And I, I think overall, uh, they're really committed. There's a lot of people that are really committed, hardworking, you know, the ones that will message you quickly back or, or pick up the phone whenever you need them. Uh, so, I mean, at the end of the day, like, you know, you're always going to find someone that maybe isn't the best, but the same thing goes for everyone else in the industry in other countries. You, you don't really, uh, everyone's, you know, an, an individual and, uh, they have different personalities, but I would say like overly, uh, overly it's positive for sure. Well, seems to me like we have a soft spot from, for the people from the Balkan area. Uh, we know <laughs> the Macedonia as well. Can you, now, can you tell us a bit about your Macedonia experience and donating to charity? Sure, sure. So I, uh, that was in May of 2022. So exactly two years ago. Uh, and I visited, I went to go visit Boris Panov. Uh, Boris is a good friend of mine. We met obviously on LinkedIn uh, through his memes, but uh, we've definitely developed a, a friendship uh, from that. And uh, we ended up visiting uh, Superior Dispatch Services out in Stip, uh, Macedonia. And so uh, that was my first trip to like, uh, I guess, well, not the Balkans, but that was my first trip uh, to the Balkan area in terms of like, uh, visiting dispatching companies. Uh, so Macedonia is a lot smaller than, than Serbia is what I would take away from that. It's like when I landed in Macedonia, it was definitely like 
very a lot fewer people, like less smaller cities. Uh, Belgrade, I think, was more probably uh, more things to do. Same with Novi Sad. Uh, it was kind of more like Steep. Steep is a small city. There's, I think, 50,000 people uh, that live in Steep. But we had a great time, too. Uh, Boris took care of us. Uh, we were there for, I think, three or four days. Uh, we, we, we had some, we went clubbing a couple times because Boris used to be a famous DJ uh, in, in his area. And so everyone in, in Steep knows Boris. When we were there, everyone would come up to Boris and everyone knew him. Uh, so that was that was a lot of fun, and I think we're actually probably going to go back there uh, sometime soon. Boris wants us to go uh, for the opening of Superior Dispatch uh, Services office, new office. So. And where the, the, the this idea uh, of donating charity came? Uh, so we donated we donated uh, food. What what I did was I created like this kind of video where it's like how much can a hundred dollars buy for you in Macedonia, just to kind of give I guess context to. American viewers, like, you know, like, I guess the cost differences between the United States and Macedonia. So we ended up just filling up a cart uh, that was like $100 worth of food just to show everyone, like, how much you could buy for $100 in Macedonia. And then we donated it to uh, the charity, the kids. Uh, there was a foundation that Boris's wife knew, and she drove, dropped off the food there. That was the noble act, I would say. Let's, let's move a bit to, to the present time. Uh, you can just launch the Shipper CRM platform. Want to walk us through it? Yeah, uh, definitely. So I'll give some background uh, on how it came to be. Uh, this was August of 2022. I was I tweeted something uh, on Twitter, and back then I didn't really have that many followers. But I, I like this tweet for this got like 20 likes, and I'm like, okay, kind of interesting. I usually get like a few likes. This is 20 likes. So I I was looking at who liked who liked the the photo, and I saw there was like Christian Gavis, and I, I right away recognized that it was a Polish name. And so I click on his profile, and he was the founder of Autobahn.ai, which was like a company that created uh, technology for trucks. And so I was like, oh, maybe he'd be you know interested in doing a podcast. He's Polish, so we connected obviously that way. And I reached out to him, uh, you know, just to learn more about him. And and he kind of uh, you know agreed to set up a call. It was not a podcast recording, just to kind of meet. And and he told me that he had just recently closed a startup uh, and, and he's looking for a new project. And he, he's a software engineer, so that's like, he, he knows how to program uh, applications. And he was looking for something new to do. And so, um, long story short, we got together. We got an investor, uh, which is Tim from Ascend TMS, to kind of back us and to build out this. At first, what was it was only going to be a CRM for freight brokers. And for people that are, are maybe don't know, a CRM is, uh, it stands for customer relationship management. It's a tool, like there's tools like HubSpot, Salesforce. And usually those those are really generic kind of platforms, which are powerful, but they typically have a few missing maybe features for people that are in freight. And so like our whole idea was like, we're gonna we'll create a CRM. Um, Tim from Ascend TMS said that if, if we create it, we could, we could integrate with Ascent TMS, so all Ascent TMS users could use a CRM. And so we're like a month into it, and then Christian, my co-founder, is like, Paul, he's like, what What do people really want? And he's like, people want leads. People want to talk to shippers. Uh, and he's like, what if we create a database and a CRM? And I'm like, okay, like this is, you know, like pretty com more complex. A lot of companies don't, no company really creates a database and a CRM. Usually those are two separate platforms. Um, and so we kind of started focusing on the database, uh, aspect. We kept the name shipper CRM. It's still called shipper CRM and we still have a CRM component, which is a kind of like a basic component of the software. Our most powerful feature right now is a database of shippers. And our whole goal is to get every single shipper that ships freight, uh, in the United States on this map. So we have a map, you log in and you just have dots all over it. You could zoom in, you could click on a map, click on a dot, pulls up the company name. Uh, it pulls up like the phone number, what they ship, what they do, revenue. And then let's say you want to reach out to like the logistics manager. Uh, we have like logistics manager contacts available. You can click on their LinkedIn profile. You could purchase their credit or the contact information if you want to get their phone number and email. And so like we, we launched, we fully launched it last month, uh, actually exactly a month ago on April 9th, we launched it exactly then. Um, it's, it's been taking a while to kind of get it all built up. Uh, it's been a year and a half, but we've got some really good feedback. We have 
we have uh, a lot of now customers that are loving the product. They're getting a lot of use cases or uses out of it. Uh, they're contacting shippers from our from our system and having good conversations. So it, it's definitely very powerful, and uh, we're currently you know just working on making sure that we get every single shipper in the United States uh, in our database. And if anyone's interested in checking it out, we have an application process. Uh, you just go to shippercrm.com, click apply, and you fill out the information, and then uh, we'll schedule like a demo with you. We'll post the link down below so they can find it, okay? Thank you. Uh, what would be the the number one benefit of Shipper CRM platform? Uh, the number one benefit is definitely getting access to a lot of shippers like context, well, when you're when you're a freight broker, you're if you're in customer sales, you're working, uh, you're calling shippers nonstop. You're you know trying to build relationships. You're trying to get freight, and you know there's some trucking companies that also have sales. Typically, they're larger size. Uh, but honestly, if you're a trucking company that's fed up with brokers, you probably want to check this out because it's a way for you to contact shippers, call shippers. It's not easy. The thing is, like right now, there's so many brokers and trucking companies in this industry that like shippers are getting bombarded nonstop. So you definitely have to differentiate yourself, but, and you have to be a good salesperson at, and also provide a good service. Uh, but at the same time, like instead of having to use a few tools, like we kind of, uh, a lot of brokers use Google maps. They Google, they go Google maps, satellite mode. They go to some industrial park. They click on a shipper, pull up their information that to Google them for more info. Then they have to go on LinkedIn in a separate tab and pull up the person. It's like, it's just a lot of work and inefficient. We just have it all in one. So instead of you like wasting time, we save you time. So I would say that's the number one benefit. And you have easy access to a lot of shippers and you could just pull them up uh, whenever you like. And then you could also use our CRM, uh, which is a simple tool, but you could track relationships. And if you want to use your, your own CRM, like HubSpot, Salesforce, or whatever CRM you're using, you could easily move that to your CRM as well and just use us as a database. Well, sounds like you've done a great job. Oh, I, all credit to, to my co-founder, Christian. He's the one, be, he's the brains behind that. Great, great. I I, I hope I'll see it in action soon. Uh, I want to move, move away from uh, this stuff right now. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the markets. and. Okay. Now it's uh, election year and politics and the economics are somehow always tied the bind between themselves and taking into consideration yep. the election year is um, where we are in right now. Yeah. So most of the politicians still do use this uh, Ukrainian and Russian conflict as an excuse for current state, state of the economy that um, even USA is in, uh, but it has been, this down spiral has been going for some time now. What would you think that is the reason uh, for the current state of the economy and do you think that the excuse could be used still? So, interesting enough, if you look at volumes, uh, or like the freight volumes overall, like volumes are higher now than they were in 2019. Uh, and I think even 2018, if I'm not mistaken, I know 2018 was a good, good year for trucking. Uh, I was a broker still then, but like, so what happened during COVID was just so many trucking companies open, so many freight brokerages open that there's just too many people in this industry. And that's kind of like, I would say overall for our industry probably the biggest problem in terms of like actually uh, having a better market. It's all supply and demand. If you want to have better rates, there has to be fewer trucks in the road uh, or more freight. But overall, volumes are pretty steady. Um, sure, they have dipped from like their highs, but like a lot of the, the highs of 2021 and 2022 were caused by all the printing of money during COVID uh, because people had an influx of cash or buying more goods. And so like it's tough to say if like the economy really is right now in a bad situation, or is it just because the fact that there's just so many trucking companies that are causing the, you know, the supply to be increased and demand to be lowered, causing lower prices. That's part of it. Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely complex. I'm not an economist, so it's tough for me to speak exactly on this. And I don't know, I don't, I don't really listen to a lot of, uh, like 
I guess the the politics side of things. I I kind of just focus on what's going on in freight. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. From competitive market to fierce competition to even more complicated taxes, it is another statement to say that the water in which private individuals swim are fast and murky. Fortunately, today's digital age comes to help, and I found my way to easier business with Newbase. With Newbase, in just few clicks on my computer, I opened a company with a bank account in the USA and connected the world's most recognized payment processor to my website. If you are developing your e-commerce or dropshipping business, or just want all the benefits that the company in USA offers, partner with professionals and follow the well-trodden path that Newbase offers. Click on the link in the description of this video in order to grab your 10% discount on Newbase offer. Uh, but it's it's definitely a complex situation and people keep uh, analysts and people that are experts keep pushing back their predictions of when it's going to get better, when it's going to get better. Like you heard Q2 of 2024 and now it's, you know, Q2 of 2025. And it is tough to say it was just so good for such a like for three years, I think it was just or two, two and a half years or so it was so good that, uh, you know, like right now, uh, you know, either companies have to shut down. Uh, so there has to be less supply uh, or the, the or the I don't know, the people need to have more money and spend more, which is probably not going to happen. So if anything, it's it's, it's tough to say, and I don't want to, I don't want to make a prediction for when it's going to get better. Cause I, I think it's really tough to, uh, but uh, in order for the market to get better, it's either you need people with money to spend and people don't really have money right now to spend, um, because of inflation being so high, uh, for the last two years. Uh, and secondly, it's, uh, or you just need less stretch than I wrote. Well, do you know what I think, uh, frequently about we are constantly uh, mentioning the truck number, trucks on the road, new new companies open, etc. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, trucks on the road, new companies open, etc. But uh, there are not that many new drivers on the road. So most of the new companies that have been opened are the drivers that have been driving for someone for some time, either as uh, owner operators, either as um, company drivers, and then when it was good, they decided they, they should start their own way. And somehow for most of them, it didn't work out. But uh, to me, somehow it looks like there's still fair amount uh, of the trucks, uh, same as it was, uh, just new legal entities that now exist because of uh, of uh, this but like there's there is not like a million new drivers that have entered the market that have never been driving before or am i wrong i don't know exactly to be honest i don't know the data on that what i do what i have read about recently was the fact that there's apparently an influx of illegal uh, drivers from like Mexico driving illegally in the States. Uh, like, so I know there's an influx of that Freightways reported about it last week. So there is an influx of, of those, uh, drivers on the road. Uh, and then secondly, I have heard of, uh, a lot of, I still, I'm not sure how many there are, but I know there's still a lot of Eastern European drivers that are getting visas to be truck drivers in America. I don't know how the numbers have changed. And I, I honestly, it's tough for me to like speak on this topic because I just don't have the data. Uh, but overall, it, it still seems like, like I know people in Eastern Europe and like, I know there's a few, uh, or there's, I know a few of, uh, a few people from Ukraine that went to the U S to be truck drivers now. And so like, it seems that it's still, there are still drivers coming in. I just don't exactly know the numbers. Okay. Okay. Well, sounds, sounds interesting. I would say that, uh. Because like maybe half a year ago, there was a uh, web conference by CHR and they were mentioning how it's not harder, it's not, not hard to find a good driver. Uh, it's hard to find a driver. So it seems that people are finding uh, creative ways to get to 
workforce. Okay, interesting. I know there, there's a debate on Twitter where it's like, is there a driver shortage or not? Everyone, the, I think the American Trucking Association keeps saying there's there's a truck driver shortage, and then there's a lot of people saying there's no truck driver shortage. I mean, I know I know some companies, trucking companies, that have like a wait list of fifty drivers, um, because like they're reputable companies, they're good, people want to work for them, and like. A few years ago, there was like, you know, maybe that was like 10, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you think that um, after the, the pandemics or during the pandemics, when uh, box trucks uh, who were predominantly uh, last mile carriers moved to OTR, that that has somehow shifted the industry itself? In... I honestly can't. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's, it's something that I can't really speak about because I, I haven't really read about it or, or talked to too many people about uh, about that. Uh, so uh, I would, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to think about it then to talk maybe for the next episode. Okay, sounds good. Uh, the slow market has been going on for some time and now in the past six months to a year, uh, fraud has joined it. Uh, and it has been prevalent. Uh, I would say it's an infestation. If you are in any way touched by it, it's yeah. very hard to continue business as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think is there any way to put an end to it? Well, I think technology could definitely be a tool to be used. Like there's there's definitely platforms like Highway um, out there that like are are trying to to focus on that. It is. The difficulty in, in completely stopping it is definitely that like these these scammers are being more and more creative, right? They 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 do some kind of scam and then you know maybe everyone learns about it so they don't they're having difficulties and then they try to another scam and it's just like the fact that we're all on computers you know and phones uh, away from each other it, and honestly at the end of the day like what solves it is actually having relationships with the people you work having dedicated lanes you know. Uh, if you're working off of spot loads all day, then you're going to run into fraudulent situations. So the only way to prevent that is to have a list of companies that you work with 80% of the time. And if you're focused on spot loads, I know it's it's easier said than done, but I think there there has to be that component of a relationship. Like know who you're working with, like understand, you know, who they are, uh, verify people, you know, like don't like don't believe people that you don't know like over the phone, you know, it's like verify, figure out a way to make sure that that person's actually a legitimate carrier, legitimate broker, uh, whatever it may be. Cause like, I think a lot of people are too kind of busy, you know, they're dealing with a lot of stuff where, okay, they hear a rate. Oh, that's a good rate. Send it over. They don't even look at the fact that the email address is different than the company's actual domain address. You know, it's like a lot of the things could be stopped if, if people were just to calm down for a second and be like, okay, let me just verify all this stuff, you know, even if it's like calling the broker's real phone number online to just to verify, hey, is this a real load with you? Uh, same with the carrier side. Uh, so I, I think that uh, a lot of it is, is a lot of these mistakes are, are created by people because they're rushed. They're rushed because they want the good rate. They believe it's a true rate. In reality, you're just getting scammed. You know, it's like it, people have to either just to slow down for a second. If they slow down and were to verify information and have real relationships, I'm pretty sure a lot of these fraudulent situations wouldn't exist. And Paul, you you told us and you explained us already how shipping CRM works. So it's uh, connecting Google data with uh, like LinkedIn platform and the profiles, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that using something as such uh, for carriers and for the brokers to make a strong online presence digital would be a maybe a path to where it's resolving this fraud issue uh i mean i don't think we'll i don't think our platform will resolve fraud uh because there's always going to be people that are scamming out there and you know hoping to make a quick buck uh by taking someone else's money so I don't think like we're not we're not gonna solve the fraudulent issues. I, I think um, we're here to help you create relationships with shippers. If if you want to have a shipper 
if you want to be able to, you know, get freight from them, that's what we're here to do. We are actually like our system. We we're partnered with highway to where, like, if you want to have an account, you have to go through highways background check. So we don't have any, we're not allowing any fraudulent players into our system. That's one of the, the things that we, we realized early on was that like, if we allow fraud fraudsters or scammers in our system, they could then start, you know, scamming shippers, or they could start pretending to be shippers and calling brokers and carriers and scamming them that way, just making it easier. So one of the things that we did was like, we don't want any scammers. So we do have an application process. You have to apply, you have to put in your MC number. Once it's approved uh, and we check your domain, that's that's when you could actually become a customer and a user of ShipperScram. But overall, like, uh, I, I do have to get back to my point of like, each individual dispatcher broker has to take responsibility on themselves to verify who they're working with. Um, if it's a new person they don't know, take extra steps, you know, don't believe everything you hear. Cause like, like I said, like, you know, there's no, that relationship is me missing. It's transactional from like a spot board. So I would say if you do that, that will solve a lot of the situations out there. And, and then if you would like some shippers, you can use shipper Sierra. Well, all. Thanks to our time and thanks for being a guest of the show. It was a pleasure having you. Well, likewise, it was great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. For all of you that are watching or listening to our podcast, don't forget to like and su subscribe to our channel. Until the next one. Bye.